Okay, so thanks for coming. Thank you, Amsterdam. Uh, my name's Nigel Poulton. I am moderating this panel of, I won't say, <laughs> where we're going to talk about future technologies, um, processes and things, and how they're changing the way that we do IT. What I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to give the mic to each person in turn, give them 30 seconds to introduce themselves. I'd like it to be interactive from an audience perspective as well. If you've got any questions about things like cloud, containers, DevOps, anything like that, pipe your hand up. I'm going to come and give you the mic, okay? Because it's going to be recorded and go out as a podcast too. In Tech We Trust podcast, we've got stickers lying around and everything. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, I've also been instructed, hold the mic like this, not like, or whatever. Okay, so we're cool. So um, I'm just going to let the guys pass the mic along the front of the line, and then we'll crack straight on. I'm Nigel. Hello, I'm uh, Shachar Feinblit. I'm Kaminario CTO. Uh, Kaminario are developing all flash storage. <coughs> Hi, I'm Tom Hollingsworth, and uh, as a networking guy, I took a wrong term at Albuquerque and ended up here somehow at a storage conference. <laughs> Uh, I'm a networking blogger and uh, tweeter, and I am also an organizer for the Tech Field Day event series. Hi, oh, you should know who I am by now. I'm Martin Glassborough, blogger, commentator, and all-round know-it-all. Chris Mellon, storage writer for The Register. Happy to be here. Hi, I'm Hans O'Sullivan. I haven't had a chance to talk to you yet. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of a company called Store Magic, and uh, been in the storage industry for many years. I had a few different companies previous to this. Um, I just like keeping things simple. I am shocking with names. I've forgotten your names already. Never mind. So, the first question I'd like to pose to the panel, and if anybody has input as well, pipe up. We'll give you the mic, okay? Um, Tom, you're all right. Um, the first question is around software-defined networking and potentially software-defined storage as well, okay. I want to know um, what kind of an impact that is having on organizations who are deploying it. So if you know any organizations, if your organization is deploying any, if you've got stories from it, I want to know how that is changing from, I'm going to call it the bad old days of, you know, there's a Symmetrics team here and there's, an HDS team there, and there's a, a filer team over there. H how is this changing the industry and the IT market for the better? Come on, Tom. Since you called me out, I'll go ahead and start. Um, Software-defined networking and software-defined, well, pretty much everything, has changed the market and changed organizations from a perspective of um, increasing agility. Um, I've, I've talked in the past about how I don't see traditional organizational structures as being agile to en enable business development. It's really a chance for people up the chain to blame people when things go wrong. And that's why things like DevOps are starting to take off, is because DevOps gives us the opportunity to quit blaming each other and get shit done, really. Um, no, but at the same time, in order to do that, the, the technology that we use has to be capable of being extensible and, and agile and all those other words that, that we were misusing to talk about technology. Um, really, software defined didn't start with networking or storage. It started with compute power. I mean, 15 years ago, if you'd have told me that I could run an operating system in a software construct on independent of the hardware, I'd have laughed at you. And now look at it. Do you think that the, uh, the compute market looks the same as it did back when we were running Windows on iron boxes? No. That's, that, that's where we're headed with the rest of this, is, is divorcing ourselves not of hardware completely, but of the need to be tied to specific hardware. Ross? Also, we're looking at a way to build uh, storage systems. Uh, so even if you are selling the hardware, um, it is uh, now a very different game. So you can uh, uh, choose the most cost-efficient hardware available. And yes, customer will not can uh, buy a storage array without the complexity. And the vendor can just bring the most cost-efficient hardware which is available and mix and match new technologies with old technologies while preserving the old investment and expanding the system in the most cost-efficient way. And yes, it's coming with scale-out architectures. I'll, I'll, bri I'll bring the mic to you in a second. Can I just ask for a show of hands in the audience, right? From a software-defined perspective, 
and that ability to divorce yourself from the hardware. Can I get a show of hands if you think that's real? Is it actually happening in your organization now? Can I, anybody who thinks it's real? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm, I'm going to say about half of the audience. Um, those of you who maybe didn't put your hand up, do you think it will be real for you in the future? So only if you didn't, yeah. So I'm getting a, a lot of people saying, if it's not here yet, it's coming. Okay, just wanted the feel, thank you. Uh, so the question you asked a minute ago is what sort of an effect we're seeing it causing to some of our customers and what we're actually seeing happening. Um, how we provide software-defined storage is slightly different uh, than to a lot of the other th uh, people you'll hear uh, here today. Uh, we tend to deal with organizations that have a lot of remote locations. Uh, they still require software-defined, but they need something that's extremely simple. So uh, we're dealing with organizations that might have 1,000 or 2,000 sites. In each of those sites, they want to have software-defined. And what it's actually allowing them is to totally commoditize the hardware that's there. Basic principle, that's what they're trying to do. And I've seen a couple of big situations where, they, where our customer is actually going out to the four big server vendors and saying, we want software defined in each of these locations, just give us your best price. And it is tough on the vendors, even if they're lying. Uh, it's tough on the vendors because it's just down to price. This is the spec, deliver that spec, that is what I want to see. We've moved to software defined in each of our remote locations. My personal preference is that software defined storage as a term is really useless. I think software defined storage should be split into software controlled storage versus software only storage. Software only storage, great. Software controlled storage, equally great. But the two are completely different. If I ask how many people here have petrol-driven vehicles, you'll probably all stick your hands up. As far as I know, you could be riding a scooter, a lawnmower, a motorcycle, a tank, a Hummer, an SUV, a sedan. Petrol-driven vehicles tells me nothing. Software-defined storage tells me nothing I want to know. If it's software-only storage, that tells me something I want to know. If it's software-controlled storage, that's good too, because that means I can alter the way the storage runs through software. Do we have anything on this topic from the audience? Anybody got a question they want to pipe at the panel? Yeah. Vadim. Um, considering that the world is moving to a software-based intelligence and so on, how I wonder how most of the vendors are treating um, software development concepts which we find really useful in this in for example at Facebook at Amazon at Google where they do continuous delivery continuous deployment uh, and so on in the storage world because nobody is actually accepting any upgrades nobody is accepting any new features everybody is you know updating once every two years but if we're moving all the intelligence into the software, why don't we actually benefit from what we can actually do with the software? It rolling upgrades, new features every day, continuous deployment in the storage world. Okay. Howard just said it's risk. Your data in many ways is the most important thing you can have. If you go and corrupt all your data, your business is now gone down the swanee. So you've, you, you, it's, it's not going to happen, very, although there is at least one vendor who's kind of in stealth at the moment, who's doing very rapid releases. They're releasing probably two to three, or two, two to three weekly cycle. Um, but they don't really have any production deployments yet, and it's because it, it's very early days for them. If you've got a lot of legacy, heritage, whatever you want to call it, data, you're not going to risk it. It's the most important thing you have. If your server falls over, your server falls over. You reboot it, you restart it. If you've just gone and corrupted 50, 60, 70 terabytes, petabytes worth of data, your RPO is just horrendous. So I can see there is a desire to do this. I just don't see, certainly in the big enterprise space, it's not a risk that any audit department is going to take. There's also the reward side. If, if Facebook adds a new feature, that might get them some new customers and therefore sell some more ads. 
but storage guys are very slow to accept the features that are there. Right? Vivals has been out for a year. Seven customers are running them in production. And so, you know, I the the continuous feature addition at the storage layer doesn't give the organization anything because they still need to have applications and servers take advantage of those storage features, and that's going to take multiple months. So having weekly updates of the storage system doesn't benefit the user who's having the system updated weekly because their applications can't use that new feature till months later when they're satisfied it works and they've added it to that code. So I think part of the problem is that we look at systems like storage and networking and compute as pieces that, that are invalid, they can't be touched because they're doing something important, right? Fifteen years ago, nobody updates a Windows 2000 box while it's running. We have a maintenance window where we patch it because God help us if it doesn't come back up. Today, we don't care. We snapshot the box, we do the patch, and we push the new one into production. Nobody knows anything happened. Networking is finally starting to move down that road where things like SDN and automation allow us to make network configuration changes rapidly. I mean, everyone blames the networking team for taking weeks to make a change to check it into production. You know why? Because if we check in the wrong change, the entire network crashes. Storage is the same way. We can't update a box that's currently holding data, right? Unless we aren't storing data on a box, but on a cluster or on a system that the individual component members can be updated on a, rep on a rapid basis to fix bugs, to slowly introduce a feature that can be tested and implement it. Because how many times have we gotten a laundry list of, hey, here's version 9.0 and it has 87 new features of which 84 of you don't need. Wouldn't it be easier to get one new feature every three weeks that we can test, that we can make sure is going to work and implement that just in time for the next feature to come out. But that only works if we can abstract the usefulness of the system away from what's running that. I'm actually quite surprised by the question uh, because uh, I find the exact opposite. Uh, they, our customers typically want their systems to do a job. They want that job to continue working. They actually use the term set and forget. They don't want changes to it. So if I, if I say to the customer, I've got an upgrade, I have a new feature, they say to me, why do I need that? It's doing the job I actually want. The last thing they want to do is roll out a new version, a new upgrade, if it's doing the job that they actually have. The last thing they want to do is cede control to me to decide when I'm going to give them an upgrade or roll out something. They actually just wanted to do the job in the first place and leave it be. I just, I just have two words about it. Fail fast. Okay. What we see is that uh, architecture that are software defined and are scale out are able to deploy new technologies faster. So uh, for instance, in our case, we are able to deploy new flash technologies very fast. And since we build a single cluster, you can mix and match all technologies and new technologies. And this way, you can bring the value of the progression in the uh, flash technologies for in our case, like 3D NANDs, TLC NAND in a much faster rate than other architectures that are not software-defined architectures. So yes, uh, of course it's enterprise, you need to be responsible when adding new stuff, but you can do it much faster than uh, how things uh, used to be a few years ago. One more from the audience. Okay, what if it we take it from the other side? You're talking about the risk of applying a patch but I think we have come to a point that it is the other way around, about being bigger risk, not applying the risk, because everybody said so. Sefer, uh, software is uh, deployed very quickly. There are a lot of bugs. So the chances not applying updates become bigger risk than not applying them. So I think you have to turn it around a bit. I actually have a comment about it. So. Uh Vendors are using advanced analytics, back office analytics. So, uh, for instance, we know which are the customers are exposed to issues when looking and doing BI on the data that the system is sending to the back office. So, 
yes, we don't want to, uh, applying a, a fix is a risk as well. So we do not want to apply every fix to every customer, but if we know that this specific customer is exposed to the problem, we come to the customer and tell him you need to do it as fast as possible. So with an, uh, advanced analytics on the back office, you can do things that are much, much smarter than just saying, okay, everybody take this uh, upgrade path. Can I just have a st another straw poll to the audience then? Do you, as a customer, or do you have customers who upgrade storage systems and maybe network systems as well during the business day? Can I get a show of hands if you do? So that's like, I, I'm quite surprised at that. That's probably more than half of the people in the audience. Um, has, has soft, uh, just another show of hands, has software defined or uh, more modern storage architectures and network architectures influence that? So no, okay, yes. So you're saying no, do you have old style systems that you would still upgrade during the business day now? Yeah? yeah? I mean, I've been doing updates on r live systems for like 15 years. So, and 15 years ago, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, there wasn't something li like software defined. So, I think that software defined is also more of a wrap off of something that's already there because it all brings down to knowing your system, have the right scripts, know what you're doing, and if you know what you do and you configure it correctly, you can do live updates. Not that I was looking, but Sebastian's balls are bursting out of his jeans there. He's got some big old <laughs> balls to do that. Oh, go on, one last one before we change topic. Okay. Define business day. We're now on a 24-hour day. You're going to be doing your upgrades during a business day. Everybody's doing them. It doesn't make any difference. You might as well do it in the day when everybody's awake than actually do it at night when half the people's asleep. Okay, so I want to switch tacks just very quickly. Um, how long do we have, Enrico? Six minutes. Six minutes, okay. So, uh, cloud, okay, and, and public cloud storage, okay. Um, is that having an impact on maybe your business, Martin, at all? And are you seeing, are you, you guys bleeding customers out to the cloud? Is that having any kind of change there? Well, public cloud storage really depends where you're going to run your compute. If you're going to run your compute in the cloud, you'll use public cloud storage. If you need to access that data regularly and you're running your compute locally in your uh, on-premises, on you're going to have you're going to have some problems. It's go, it's your latency issues are going to be horrendous for a, for a lot of these things. I'm sorry, but rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a fast front-end caching device like something from Avia or people like that, then your latency, as long as you have cache hits in the front-end device, will be perfectly adequate for doing primary storage in the cloud. Right. Okay, so you put an Avira in, that's, that's fine, you can do that for, for a lot of stuff. You're still going to be transferring a lot of data in and out of the cloud. Those costs become very expensive very quickly if you start throwing data in and out of the public clouds. They don't charge you a lot of money to store that data, they charge you an awful lot of money to access that data. I give up. <laughs> Good answer. Anybody have anything on that from the audience? You can negotiate those transfer fees. You can negotiate those transfer fees from Howard. Yeah. 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 So um, I think it was Enrico's presentation earlier was talking a lot about disk drives and flash drives and IOPS and price per gigabyte and things like that. And as important as that is, it's all very complex, okay, whereas if I go to Amazon Web Services, I don't have to care, okay, is it a Caminario this or that, or, or whoever vendor, right? I just say, right, it's either magnetic, it's SSD general purpose, or it's provisioned IOPS, right? It's, it, it seems to me to be much simpler. Um, are, are we moving towards that, and is that going to hurt potential, you know? I don't have to care anymore about doing a POC between two vendors after whittling it down from 20 vendors, I just go, right, it's either Amazon or it's Azure or whatever, and I've got three choices for storage, and it's so easy for me. It's a model that everyone is moving to in, in the world, not just in IT, but all over the place. We want simple, 
we want you know red light green light kind of you know numbers when's the last time anybody realistically bought a car a phone or a house based on a feature set not 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 just you know uh, it has this many square feet it has this many bathrooms with that toilet or how much RAM does your phone have when's the last time you honestly bought a phone based on the amount of RAM it has versus how fast is it does it does it meet my requirements Amazon is the Apple model of IT. You don't know what runs underneath the hood. All you get is an interface that says, it goes this fast, it will give you this ability. And you know what? People love that. Because people do not want to spend half their day looking through a performance spec sheet to go, well, you know, if I use this function, then I get four more IOPS, which means that I will save 44 cents off my IT cost over the next 10 years. You know who thinks like that? Accountants, because they have nothing better to do. So you're, you're right, the cloud is very important, and there's a lot of, of applications that are moving to the cloud. But it's a very, very dangerous strategy for every IT company to think they're going to move everything into the cloud. There's a lot of people out there that are doing their best to find ways to actually disrupt your business. And if you don't actually look at your business and what's important to you and how you service your customer, an internal customer or an external customer, and under what is the minimum time you can, you can manage to be without those services or without that data and plan accordingly, you have a very, very risky strategy. So you need to use the cloud for what it's good at. You need to have that variability within your business to actually move what you can into the cloud and make sure that key applications are still capable of servicing your customers no matter what happens in the cloud. Amazon just fell down, didn't it? We're going <laughs> to talk about that later. One last, one last point. Okay, so uh, from what we see, cloud also comes with other complexities in other dimensions, and also there are cost issues involved. Uh, so moving everything to the cloud is in many cases not practical. What we see in the enterprise is that in many cases, uh, similar approaches are taken. Vivo, for instance, with policies make things easier uh, to manage storage, uh, for instance. I, I, I believe, yes, it's, it's a, a, it will not happen in a day, but, but, but I think the policy management element of Vivo, I think, will make things simply, uh, simplify for customer. Of course, when there is a, a technology shift and there are changes, it's not happening in a day, but uh, these type of things, uh, m m changing the, way the abstraction layer of uh, managing storage. That AWS customer is the developer. He's the, the customer of IT infrastructure. And you're comparing what he's buying to what we're buying to provide services to him. And so, yes, it's got to get simpler to that administrator. And so I need to do OpenStack Cinder with QoS control so that I can offer him the same bronze, silver, gold levels of service. But that doesn't mean that I, as the guy who's building it, don't need to pay attention to how it's done. And we'll wrap on that note. So um, the, light, the video stream may go out on the podcast channel as well. So does everybody want to turn and wave to the camera and say, hi, mum? <laughs> you, you get famous if it goes out. On, hey, there we go. All right, thank you, everybody on the panel, gentlemen. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, thank you for your input. Um, because we're going to record a podcast, right? If you guys all wait in here for dinner, I'm going to get mine first.